for, for that. Um, so I was talking about uh, uh, Rupert Murdoch's uh, uh, father, Sir Keith, and his opposition to yes, the uh, and yes. And I was talking about Rupert himself, who uh, in 1989, um, addressed uh, a well-known, uh, uh, the, the Edinburgh Television Festival, which is the sort of big talk fest of television in the, in the United Kingdom. Um, and he condemned the BBC. He said it was unfair competition, uh, the same refrain as his father's. 20 years later, exactly, 2009, James Murdoch was the keynote, spe keynote speaker at the same uh, Edinburgh Television Festival. And he echoed the same complaints about, about the BBC. Um, being unfair competition, uh, getting too big, doing too many things that the commercials were already doing. As James said, we seem to have decided to let independence and plurality wither and to let the BBC throttle the news market and get bigger to compensate. Um, Murdoch's British newspapers, The Sun and The Times, were always ready to jump on the anti-BBC bandwagon. They've joined other right-wing semi-tabloids in the UK, the Daily Mail, Daily Express, in pushing Boris Johnson's government to promise to abolish the BBC's license fee in three years' time. Whether, of course, there will still be a Conservative government in three years' time in the UK remains to be seen. In Australia, News Corp's newspapers and above all Sky News uh, have the same tenor. In the tabloids, uh, the Daily Telegraph uh, in Sydney, uh, the Courier Mail in Brisbane, the uh, Herald Sun in Melbourne, and so on, the Advertiser in Adelaide. Uh, Andrew Bolt, Rita Panahi, Tim Blair, Piers Ackerman, you know the list, I'm sure, uh, are obsessively, you know, go on and on about the evils of the ABC. I can't think of any columnists on the, on the, on the Murdoch tabloids who have a good word to say, uh, for the most part, uh, about the ABC. The Australian, even more so, really, some of its columnists, Chris Kenny, for example, Gerard Henderson, have made a living out of attacking the ABC for nigh on 40 years. I think it's amazing that they haven't kind of got bored of the subject. Uh, Morris Newman and Janet Albertson, uh, a former chairman and a board director, respectively, of the ABC, are almost as obsessed. Nick Cater, now at the Menzies Research Centre, uh, but previously uh, the editor of The Weekend Australian, uh, is almost as obsessive and so on. Now, just last week, the editor-in-chief of The Australian, Chris Dore, uh, gave the first in a series of lectures uh, sponsored by the admirable Judith Nielsen Institute uh, about journalism. Uh, he spent most of it uh, complaining bitterly about uh, Twitter and particularly the activities of journalists on Twitter. Um, quite why they're so obsessed with Twitter, I'm not sure. Uh, but remarkably, perhaps to some, he bewailed the loss of objectivity and impartiality among too many uh, news reporters. Uh, what we are seeing, said Chris Dore, far too much nowadays is activism, partisan reporting, lack of objectivity and lack of fairness. Commentary is all too frequently indistinguishable from news reports. That's a criticism that many of us, including me while I was at Media Watch, uh, would aim fairly and squarely at the Australian. But Dore continued, too many otherwise distinguished reporters are suffering from a horrendous lack of self-awareness. Oh, the irony. When taxed with his own columnists in temperance, Dore said, by the, by the chair of the, uh, of the meeting, uh, Dore said that everyone should be more polite to each other. I think he said, if the general conversations were a little bit more civil and a little less personal in terms of the working reporters and the assessment of particular stories, then I think that will then have a flow on. He was talking there about opinion columnists. This is from the man who wrote last year an extraordinary editorial in The Australian, attacking Louise Milligan and the executive producer of Four Corners, Sally Neighbour, by name. Quote, many senior people at The Australian know well the work, the habits, and the hubris of Sally Neighbour and Louise Milligan. And he went on to accuse them of bad, lazy, deceitful journalism. A little bit more civil, Chris, I would have thought might be a good idea. And I wrote a letter saying so to the Australian. Remarkably, it must have got lost because it didn't get published. Dore distinguished between reporters and opinion writers, and that's fair enough. The problem is that these days it is opinion, not news, that sells newspapers and television. 
just look at Sky News. Sky News used to be owned, one sometimes forgets, by a consortium of Channel 7, 9, and B Sky B, the, um, uh, the, the, the cable channel uh, uh, in the United Kingdom. B Sky B is 30 something percent owned by News Corp, and Sky News was managed by News Corp. Uh, but uh, in late 2018, uh, it was bought outright by News Corporation Australia, and it changed. Before that, its news service was remarkably good. Its coverage of federal politics uh, was excellent. And uh, if you went into any um, office, Labour or uh, Liberal or, or whatever party in, in, in Parliament House, you'd see Sky News running in the corner. After uh, News Corp purchased Sky News, it changed. It used to have um, quite a lot of left-wing people as well as right-wing people, for example. Um, uh, Christine Keneally was a partner to Peter Credlin and, and they did a, a, a double act. Christine well, Keneally was, of course, dropped after that and, 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 and Peter has it to herself. And, and, and that happened across the board. It's the same formula as Fox News. It's gone the same route as Fox News. And let's have a look at why. In the UK, and then in the United States, Rupert discovered a right-wing working class audience, a working class audience at least that had conservative social values. Nobody else had really tapped into that audience. Uh, Rupert Murdoch with the Sun went right for it and he made a fortune as a result because it really did echo with a, a large number of people in the UK. He couldn't replicate that success in the United States at first because outside of New York City, nobody walks to work in America, they drive to work. So nobody buys tabloid newspapers off the street as they do in the UK. Uh, he couldn't really replicate that success until he discovered cable television in the 1990s. But with Fox News, he reached the same audience. It was there as he always believed. And once again, it made him a fortune. He gave the job to Roger Ailes. Uh, who had worked as a uh, propagandist, I think it's fair to say, for the Republican Party for many years before that, he got that job. And, and Ailes used uh, Fox News to push the Republican Party to the right. Um, he he favoured the right wing of the party, the famous contract with America in the early 90s, the Tea Party, heavily promoted by Fox News. And eventually along came Donald Trump. Uh, Trump actually was so popular that he didn't really need Fox News. And it was Fox that actually found that it could not do without Trump. And you had this uh, bizarre partnership that lasted really right through, uh, right, right through uh, Trump's presidency. But what, what Fox was doing long before that were two things I'll just mention briefly. One, it reinforced conspiracy theories that popped up on the, on the web and gave them legitimacy. And this has been the subject of a, of a, of a comprehensive study uh, by Harvard University showing how uh, various conspiracy theories wouldn't get much traction until Fox started pushing them. And then of course they exploded. The other thing that, that Fox News has done is done do its utmost to discredit its, its opponents, especially the big um, newspapers, the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, the uh, Washington Post and its rival CNN. Um, they're, they're, it told its audience that these uh, uh, respected news organizations were purveyors of fake news, that they were um, hopelessly biased to the left, that they stood for elitism and wokeness and all of that. And that was really successful. Uh, Fox News, it's important to understand, outrates all its rivals on cable television uh, by miles. And, and on, on some nights, it actually outrates free-to-air television. And it's made um, the, uh, uh, it, it, it made, uh, the Murdochs a great deal of money. Lachlan Murdoch, no, sorry, what, so, so then what happened when, when News Corp bought Sky News is that it went the same path and it is trying to do the same thing here. It is trying to divide this country uh, in a way uh, that the America has been divided into two warring camps. It's not so far been hugely successful because I don't think there was anything like the same number of people 
who are swept along, but it has been quite successful uh, in, in with perhaps somewhere around 10, even 20% of the population who, who, who are, have their own views kind of legitimized and, and pushed for, further, uh, especially with regard to the ABC. Sky News goes on obsessively about the ABC and how hopeless it is and how biased it is and how, how you can't trust it. And that's bound to have some effect, especially because the sort of people who watch uh, Sky News, and I, and I just mentioned in passing, that you don't have these days to uh, uh, subscribe to Foxtel as you used to to get Sky News. Uh, you can watch it on, on many excerpts uh, online. Uh, and of course, you get it free to wear in many regions in Eastern Australia, thanks to another um, overseas billionaire, uh, Bruce Gordon, who owns Wind Television, and to um, these days uh, another deal uh, that um, uh, news has made uh, with Southern Cross Stereo. So people can reach it. And some of those people are the same people that go to Liberal Party branch meetings, to National Party branch meetings, and, and raise the issue of the ABC with their members of parliament. And so it filters up. Now, what's behind it? Uh, look, I'm, I'm, get, I'm gonna leave that, that bit out because it's, but I'm happy to talk about it later. I, I, I just say briefly uh, that there are some like, um, uh, David McKnight, uh, who wrote a book about Murdoch uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, whose theory is that he's just as much driven by an ideological passion as he is uh, by the search for profit. Uh, and if that's true, I think it's equally true of his son Lachlan, and we shouldn't uh, ignore Lachlan. Lachlan is, um, of course, the CEO and executive chairman of Fox uh, in the United States. He uh, is only a non-executive chairman of News Corporation, but uh, for a long time, since probably the late 90s, Australia has been regarded as Lachlan's patch. And I, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that what is driving this foxification of Sky News is probably Lachlan Murdoch. Not that I have any particular proof of that. It's, it's very hard to know what Lachlan is doing or what he thinks. But the evidence that we have is that he's at least as right wing as his father or possibly as well. <clears throat> so another thing that uh, Rupert Murdoch has done, as David Knight tabulates, is that he has funded uh, uh, conservative think tanks uh, in the United States, in Britain, and of course in Australia. His father, Sir Keith, was a founding member of one of the most influential of those think tanks, the IPA, the Institute of Public Affairs. Back in 1943, Sir Keith and a group of like-minded um, uh, businessmen founded the IPA, uh, and its um, philosophy hasn't changed very much since then. It's for small government, it's for minimal taxes, for minimum reg regulation, uh, for maximum freedom, um, for big people to make big money. Um, Rupert uh, also supports the IPA. He was on the IPA council for nearly 15 years, from 1986 to 2000. Uh, we don't know who funds the IPA because they won't tell us. They say that if they reveal their donors, their donors would be subject to um, harassment. Um, and despite their charitable status, they don't have to reveal uh, where they get their money. But in July 2018, we did have a glimpse uh, and a very revealing one indeed, uh, thanks to the family dispute between Gina Reinhardt and her daughter Bianca. In the uh, judgment that um, the Chief Justice uh, in Equity in New South Wales gave in that, um, in that court case, uh, Her Honour Judge Julie Ward said this. He said that uh, in the schedule of Hancock Prospecting Propriety Limited, which is Gina Reinhardt's company, donations and sponsorships were provided to Bianca's solicitors. And it is disclosed that Hancock paid or provided amounts to IPA in a total of $2.3 million for the 2016 financial year and $2.2 million in the 2017 financial year. The annual reports of the IPA for those years don't mention HPPBL as a donor, and the figures set out in the reports record the vast majority of donations received from individuals. In other words, the IPA treats those massive donations as having privately come from Gina Reinhardt. And how massive? Well, in 2015-16 financial year, it's the total uh, receipts uh, from all sources for the IPA were just under $5 million. So that single donation 
from Gina Reinhart was 45% of the IPA's revenue. And then the following year, it was 37%. So there we have Gina Reinhart, richest woman in Australia, fossil fuel tycoon, as well as iron ore, arch climate change denier, uh, largely single-handedly financing the IPA. So who is the IPA? Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip that, but I, I think I'll just say this, <laughs> that the IPA has only a few thousand members. Um, it, 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 it's not got a massive influence, but among those members are a remarkable number uh, of senior politicians. Now, uh, I can't vouch for the accuracy of this list, uh, but it's certainly one that's been published. And as far as I know, nobody's been sued. Um, the former or current members, um, um, among the former or current members of the IPA are Erica Betts, Michaela Cash, George Christensen, Paul Fletcher, Josh Frydenberg, Alex Hawke, Greg Hunt, Senator James McGrath, PM Scott Morrison, Senator James Patterson, Christian Porter, Stuart Roberts, Amanda Stoker, Senator Dean Smith, Dan Tian, Alan Tudge, and Tim Wilson. There's about half the cabinet right there not to mention such former luminaries of the Liberal Party as Mitch Fifield, the former communications minister, and Tony Abbott. So, do they all subscribe to the idea that the ABC should be prioritized? Well, possibly not. Um, but I think what the IPA does do is it gives legitimacy uh, to those who are persuaded by Sky News that the ABC is a bad idea. If this supposedly respectable think tank thinks we don't need the ABC, then I'm kind of allowed to think so too. And so we come to the coalition itself. As I'm sure that you're aware, in July 2018, there was a meeting of the Liberal Party's National Council, its highest making, uh, policy making body. A motion was moved to privatize the ABC at that council meeting. The chair, Nick Greiner, called for, it was proposed by the president of the Young Liberals. Uh, and after he'd spoken uh, and talked about a billion reasons for privatizing the ABC, which was a subtle reference to its total funding, uh, Nick Greiner called for speakers opposing the motion. Not a single hand was raised, <clears throat> not a single council delegate spoke. The voting was carried, the vote to privatize was carried overwhelmingly. Of course, Communications Minister Mitch Fisfield, a member of the IPA, and so perhaps somewhat embarrassedly, uh, said mildly that the coalition government had no plans to change the ownership arrangements of the public broadcasters. And certainly a coalition government isn't bound by the Liberal National Cast and Council's platform. But privatization, privatization is still there as an official policy of the Liberal Party of Australia. And every prime minister and communications minister knows that the way to the hearts of the base of the Liberal Party is to bash the ABC. Malcolm Turnbull, its erstwhile, the erstwhile supporter of the ABC, became quite skilled at it when he was in the lodge. And just the other day, the current minister, Paul Fletcher, announced a minuscule funding increase for the ABC. And I can go into the figures later if anyone wants. Uh, and Michael Kroger, the party holder, uh, Victorian Liberal Party numbers man, uh, told Chris Kenny on Sky News that the Liberal base was furious uh, that any more money had been given to the ABC because it thought that the ABC had behaved disgracefully. You cannot count on the support of the coalition uh, to adequately fund the ABC despite uh, the, uh, I, and one suspects that, that the increase that it has awarded is basically far more to do with electorates uh, like uh, um, Goldstein in, in Victoria and, uh, and Wentworth in Sydney uh, and, the, and the rise of the independents uh, and the fear that they might lose seats uh, in electorates where the ABC is still very popular. So what can you do? Well, I'm not going to go into that in any great detail now. I do urge you to read David Anderson's little book. I do urge you to try and read uh, uh, Rickardson and Mullen's book because they will give you a lot of ammunition. I'll just say one other thing. Anyone, tell anyone who will listen that the ABC is not expensive. It costs half as much in real terms per capita of the Australian population as it did in 1988. Instead of David Hill's eight cents a day, in, in 1988 dollars, the ABC now costs just four cents a day per head. For that, 
you get six TV channels instead of one, six national analog channels instead of four back then, plus an extra six digital radio channels. And you get ABC online, including pages and pages on news and sport and science and religion and arts and lifestyle. Above all, tell them that in this age of misinformation, some of it unfortunately on Sky News, we desperately need a reliable national source of news and information. And as in this age of streaming dominated by American drama, we desperately need Australian drama, Australian music, Australian stories brought into our homes and reflecting who we are as a nation. Above all, we need to make sure that the politicians realize that talk of abolishing the ABC is a vote loser across the country. It is not an inner city preoccupation. It is not a luxury. The ABC is an essential part of Australian life and Australian nationhood. And I'll leave it there. I'm happy to- Jonathan. Ask. Thank you so much. Um, you've given us an excellent background to um, the Murdoch Press and to the IPA and their, their activities. The most pressing question that's coming in at the moment um, is about the election strategy for from the ABC alumni and what we can do. I'd emphasise that it would be great to get a, a summary of that. And if people want perhaps um, follow up, just speaking on behalf of the office here, and they may shoot me, but something um, in writing later, perhaps within the newsletter. Um, yes, well, we are um, part of our strategy, a very large part of our strategy is in fact to to do all we can to help the friends because we are very small in numbers. We may have, um, you know, some big names and Kerry, Kerry O'Brien being the biggest by far, but, um, and we have a certain amount of expertise about the ABC, uh, but we've got two to 300 members and you've got many, many thousands. So uh, what, we, what, we, what we aim to do is to, is to um, help the friends uh, in the electorates where they think there is a, 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 a real need to, to put in an effort. I mean, we're certainly, uh, Kerry is doing a lot of work with Cathy McGowan uh, and the Voices of Movement, which is, of course, allied to the individual ind independent candidates, although, although Kerry is careful not to endorse any particular candidate. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, we also, you know, we, we feed information. Um, uh, I mean, just to give you one example, here in, the, in my own in the electorate where I live in, in Wentworth in, in, in Sydney's East, um, the Liberal member Dave Sharma uh, uh, put out a, a, an election leaflet recently which claimed that he had had a part in ensuring that the ABC has got a record funding increase. Uh, now, um, that is nonsense. It is nothing like a record. And we have fed the figures um, to all the uh, opposition parties in Wentworth um, just to, to arm them with, with the figures. We'll know even more precisely after the budget exactly what the ABC is getting. Um, um, <clears throat> and we do have um, small numbers of members who are working in individual electorates, um, but mostly, uh, as I say, our, our strategy is to, uh, is, is to provide uh, a bit of star power and clout where we can. Uh, to organizations like the Friends and, and Get Up to some extent, although we're a little bit more cautious about Get Up. Um, and uh, and we, we, we coordinate quite tightly with, with Michael Henry and, um, and Cassandra Parkinson and others. I mean, for example, um, we have jointly uh, drawn up a document, I don't know if you're aware of this, that has sort of six demands that are gonna be sent to all the candidates in, in selected electorates to ask how they're gonna to respond to that. Uh, and and when we get those answers, if we get those answers, that will enable us to, uh, as the friends have done traditionally, I think, to to draw a sort of score sheet about uh, which candidates most support the ABC. Um, now that I mean, I think that's a very good initiative. Uh, we've worked closely with, uh, with with the friends in drawing up those those uh, six demands. Um, and again, we'll be we'll be doing all we can to help that effort. Uh, that may not sound all, all that comprehensive, but the, the, the truth is we, we aren't 
you know, an organization that has lots of troops on the ground, especially not, I have to say, in, in, in states other than Victoria and New South Wales, where we're quite strong. Um, and so, you know, we do what we, we think we can, we can do best. The other thing we're doing is we're making um, some videos. Uh, I know that, um, I don't know about Victoria, but certainly uh, 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 New South Wales friends have been doing quite a lot of um, uh, Facebook stuff and um, little, little, you know, ads as it were. Um, but ours are a little bit, perhaps more substantial, a little bit longer. Um, that's not, not necessarily a good thing in social media. Um, but they will be coming out um, uh, very shortly, and I and I think and hope that friends will actually help finance them because they cost a little bit of money to make. Um, and and we'll keep doing that sort of thing too because we do have some expertise in that area, and we've got some people that we well know. I mean, Philip McDonald, for example, has done one about emergency broadcasting. Kerry's done one about um, the importance of the ABC to democracy. Um, I've done one about uh, really a very short version of what I've just talked to you about tonight, about the enemies of the ABC and so forth. So um, those are coming out as well. Thank you, Jonathan. I, th I think um, that perhaps those involved today, the 200 or so, could watch carefully to, uh, for state um, ABC Friends News and perhaps National News to get an idea of what those demands are. Oh, and, they're, they're, um, they're definitely on, on the uh, Victorian Friends website, I think. Uh, Michael Henry will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm sure they're already up there. Um, and uh, that will be a focus over the pre-election time uh, to try when parties name their candidates to try and get an idea of where they stand on yeah. such things as five-year funding, That's independence right. um, uh, of the ABC board membership and many of the other issues that have right. been raised yeah. over, over years. A quick question um, that's also been um, in front of us, Jonathan, is there a... a is there a use of ABC Friends pursuing, uh, as a small organisation of volunteers, relatively speaking, pursuing the IPA? Is it worth our while? My honest opinion is it's probably not. Um, I think that, I mean, we thought about this. I did, a people may or may not be aware, I, I, I did a little video back in November um, in response to the IPA's podcast. Um, and we were a bit, you know, we were, there was a lot of debate within the alumni about whether, you know, giving them extra publicity was a good idea. Um, I think on the whole, you know, it probably was worth it because some of their so-called evidence was really outrageous and, and, and kind of laughable. Um, and at least we could point that out. Um, but the fact is, um, it's very difficult to talk to the enemy uh, or to the enemy's followers in this business. Um, the people who are dead against the ABC won't frankly listen to the friends and the people who do listen to the friends um, already uh, are not huge fans of the IPA. Uh, and so I think if you've got, um, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll have a go at them from time to time. Uh, I would have thought that the friends are much better off um, focusing on individual electorates trying to persuade um, individual candidates. And the other thing that I think we both need to do, and we haven't done quite enough of yet, uh, given that there is, it seems, one says this with a great deal of caution, a good chance um, that uh, Anthony Albanese will be the next Prime Minister, uh, we need to try to um, tie the ALP's hands to the fire a bit, uh, because all they promised so far is five-year funding. Well, that's all very well if it's healthy funding. But actually, as somebody pointed out to me, if you get a bad deal from the government at the beginning of that um, five-year period, you, you've got to put up with it for five years and not just three. So without uh, a, a, a decent increase uh, in, in the ABC's funding, and the AOP has promised nothing of the kind at the moment, um, the five-year thing is of dubious benefit, I think it'd be fair to say. I mean, it's useful. We've been calling for it. I don't want to sort of knock it. Um, and I'm glad that the ALP is committed to that because it does give a, a bit of security. But, you know, what happens if you get a Conservative government that comes in, cuts the ABC's funding and says that's your lot for the next five years instead of just three? 
And anyway, the fact is, new governments are going, you know, not to feel, I think, totally bound by that in any case, if there's a change of government. Thanks, Jonathan. There's one final question on the IPA and taking on board um, what you have said about the usefulness of the pursuit. Just in regard to the Institute of Public Affairs being a tax deductible entity for donors, um, is that um, something that's worth going for? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm a little, to be honest, I've got to confess my ignorance on this. It's often said by the IPA's enemies that it's tax deductible. It has a charity called something like the IBA Foundation, which, where do, donations to which definitely are tax deductible. I'm not clear that, for example, if you make a subscription to the IPA, if you join it as a member, that that, that subscription is tax deductible. Um, I, I think there are ways um, of donating to the IPA uh, because I think from that foundation, which is the charitable arm, uh, they do in fact pull quite a lot of money, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a big proportion of that is pulled uh, straight into the IPAs, you know, to fund its research and so on, so-called research. So, um, look, yes, it would be great if somebody can uh, spend some time really digging into that. Uh, up to now, we haven't. Okay. Thanks, Jonathan. There are some questions about the Murdoch media. Um, and I'll, the first one uh, is an interesting one. The Murdoch media seems to be shifting ground on climate change. What's the chances that they may shift ground on the ABC? Good question. Um, first, I think the shift on climate change is largely cosmetic. We had that uh, big announcement uh, 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 late last year, I think it's October or November, that um, News Corporation globally was going to um, push for uh, more radical solutions to climate change. And there was a brief burst of um, articles in papers like the, the, the Herald Sun and the Telegraph um, pointing out that you know emissions reductions weren't necessarily bad for the economy, um, that there's jobs in that and there's money in to be made and so on. But you know, the colonists haven't changed. I mean, Andrew Bolt is still um, as much of a climate denier as he ever was. And so are most of the, of the other prominent News Corp publishers, I mean, uh, columnists. Um, News Corp would say piously that, you know, it can't uh, change its columnists' opinions, that they're their own opinions and, um, and so on. Uh, so I think that I think there's been really not much difference. As for the ABC, um, my view is that the the combination of the profit motive and uh, ideology are so powerful in the case of, of News Corporation Australia. Uh, it, 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 actually, unfortunately, there's only four major news organisations left in this country. There's News Corp. There's the um, Nine Network and, and, and its uh, associated newspapers, um, including The Age, of course, and, and the Sydney Morning Herald. Uh, there's Seven and, and the associated newspapers that Stokes owns in Western Australia, where he has virtual monopoly of newspapers as well. And, and, and Seven is the leading news, news channel there. Uh, and there's the ABC. That's it. After that, you're, you're going to much smaller, I mean, vigorous, you know, the New York Times, and Guardian, and, um, Matilda and Crikey and all these things, they're all vigorous and the most of not left wing, um, but they don't have anything like the spread and the clout that those four major ones have. The ABC is the biggest uh, enemy, really, that News Corp has in a, in, in its, in a financial sense. I mean, it, it really hates the fact that the ABC News is free and that makes it difficult, it argues, to charge um, uh, for its own um, uh, offerings. And, you know, there is some truth in that. I, 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 I think news.com.au is free and, and, and that may well um, have gone to a subscriber if it weren't for the ABC. Um, but, you know, I can't see them changing. I can't see them changing. They, Rupert's been like that for, for, for his whole life. Thanks, Jonathan. I guess the other question just going on from uh, comments you made about Lachlan Murdoch within your talk, what... Um, what do you think will happen within the uh, 
Murdoch media within Australia specifically under Lachlan's leadership. And you mean, you mean if the old man finally dies? Is that what you mean? Uh, to put it bluntly? Uh, that's what I'm. That's because what as I'm long mean. as he's alive, he's still going to be the boss. You know, he's the, I, yes. I, he's much less active than he was. He spends much less time in Australia than he used to decades ago. Um, and as I say, I think that Robert Thompson, the the CEO of News Corporation globally. Um, uh, does uh, give quite a bit of leeway to Lachlan, even though Lachlan is not really uh, any more than a non-executive chairman um, in Australia. I mean, the big question, for example, is if Rupert were to go, what would happen to the newspapers? Do they make enough money uh, uh, or, or do they lose too much money to be worth continuing with? The truth is, I can't see anybody buying them. Um, and, uh, the only people that might, uh, we, we, we might be worse off. I mean, Gina Hancock, for example, has got the money to buy a lot of newspapers if she wanted to. Uh, and uh, that would not be good news. I mean, there are worse prospects than News Corporation as it currently stands. Um, so I think Lachlan shares his father's love of newspapers, but I don't think he shares his passion for newspapers. You know, Rupert is a newspaper man and has been since he was 21 um, and he's expert at them. He knows everything about that industry in a way that he doesn't about, you know, online and stuff, it's a foreign country to him. Uh, Lachlan is much more, you know, an, an online person. I think he's really interested in Sky News. I don't know how interested he is um, in the newspapers. Um, and I suspect that if they're losing money uh, that, that those newspapers may go and, and that could be um, a real issue for Australia because I don't know who else is going to, to run them. Exactly. Now, um, we've got three little lots of questions, Jonathan, so we might have to go into one and a half times speed here okay, to get I'll, through them. I'll keep my answer shorter. Uh, firstly, does the threat to the BBC have implications to the ABC? Oh, I think it does, absolutely. I mean, the, the ABC was founded in imitation of the BBC way back a number of years ago, um, or at least uh, I think that's, you know, it's a, and, and it's always, it's always kind of modeled its ethos and it's, and it's um, especially in, in news and current affairs areas on, on the BBC. I mean, the fact that I was brought in um, when I knew nothing about Australia whatsoever in 1982 to run the premier current affairs program in Australia, can't imagine it happening now, but, um, the fact that I was a producer on Panorama was kind of enough, you know. Uh, now, I think a lot of people, uh, if, if the BBC was massively truncated, which I think would have to happen if the licence fee is taken away, unless, of course, it's replaced by general government revenue as, as the ABC is paid for by general government revenue, and I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I think you would have to go to some sort of subscription model. It would become much smaller, much less powerful, and I think inevitably um, there would be huge cries for the same thing to happen here. Um, and I think it would be a major tragedy. I think BBC is, is, is you know, uh, one of the world's uh, precious resources. Just look at its coverage of the Ukraine, which is extraordinary. Um, so yes, I, I think the short answer is it would be a, a big issue. Thank you. Okay, now the next two are to do with the election. Firstly, how can we make the ABC, its funding, its, its breadth of input, an election issue? You know, I think, I think we already have, or at least I think it has already become, I'm not saying that's the alumni and friends on their own. Oh, sorry, I've got a pussycat here getting in the way. Um, we're, um, I mean, that, as I said, I think that's only one reason why on February the 7th, the government came out and announced that it was going to restore indexation to the ABC's funding. And that was to try to put, get the ABC uh, off the, agenda, the election agenda. Yeah. And they may or may not have had success in that, um, but um, they were very worried, I think, especially as I say about those electorates where the independents are strong um, and they only need to lose, you know, two or three uh, of their, as it were, safe seats uh, in Sydney and, and Melbourne. Uh, to be in dire trouble uh, in the election as a whole. And I don't think they're worried about Queensland, but I think they're very worried about Victoria 
and New South Wales. And I, so I think that we have already, that's already a sign that um, the various or Australia Institute, Get Up, um, the Friends and others have made the ABC an election issue. Uh, and I think we've just got to keep, uh, keep that up. And um, we, we, we will be publishing on our website and sharing with the Friends as soon as the, the budget does come out our analysis of just how small that increase is. In fact, on the figures that I've seen, if the figures that were published in February are, uh, include indexation for inflation, it's not entirely clear whether they do or not, but Michael Ward thinks they do, if they, then we're going to be worse off in three years in real time terms than we are now because the, the, the amount built in for inflation is, is way under what it's likely to be in reality. Um, but it, you know, so, so I think we just have to go out and counter the idea that the ABC uh, has been restored indexation, everything's fine and dandy. You know, we have lost, uh, we, would have, we would have had an extra half billion dollars minimum between 2013 and now had it not been for the cuts that have happened over that period. I don't mean Thanks, half a billion dollars a year, but half a billion dollars altogether. Thank you, Jonathan. And I'm just going to hop in with the suggestion, the, the um, passion for how to proceed in the pre-election period is, is the pressing um, issue I notice in the chat. And I would encourage people to read the ABC Friends Victorian newsletter for updates on our, compa our campaign in the individual electorates, as you mentioned, being a, a, a useful way to proceed and ways to contribute. That um, Michael Henry's newsletter that comes out each fortnight gives excellent ideas about how people can join in. And just while we're on that matter, I would mention that Michael Henry, the chair of the Victorian group and Simon Strong, who is the ABC Friends Office managers, Manager, have done the heavy lifting in getting this webinar underway. And I would thank them both really sincerely for their efforts. Okay, and they're just now bowing over there. Okay, so a question um, which is a little bit broader and wondering if you would just comment on it. We've got a couple of minutes. If we see media as the fourth pillar of democracy, its demise undermines everyone's democracy. Are there other partnerships we should be forming when we work towards the strengthening of our public broadcaster? Are there other issues we should be looking at and other groups that we should be partnering with? Well, um... Obviously, um, the uh, 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 as I've mentioned, GetUp has been very strong on this. Um, some people love GetUp. Some people are a bit more dubious about it, but it's 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 quite a, an effective organisation. Um, the Australia Institute has done some very good work on this, uh, the, um, and and uh, it's probable that if we go for particular organisations um, uh, that are more specialist, for example. Um, the children's television issue, um, you know, the, the education, the ABC does a great deal. Um, so the teachers union, those sorts of groups, uh, I mean, we, we haven't gone as far as we, we ought to uh, in, in, in getting a real list of these, of these organizations. But there are a great many organizations in this country who, who would be uh, bereft without the ABC. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think, you know, sit down, uh, work out what might be, uh, useful avenues to approach and, and see if you can get those people, uh, those organizations to, to G up their members. Just the thing is, it, the tricky thing, we've got to submit this, is that most people, even who do love the ABC, don't, they don't vote on that, you know, they, they're concerned about the cost of living, they're concerned about climate change, they're concerned about women's representation, all sorts of other issues. 
Um, and rightly so. I mean, you know, the ABC is the be all and end all. Um, and but what we need to do is to is, is to just try to make as many organisations as possible understand. Just think about what this country would be like without the ABC. I mean, I, I just I just think it would be almost unlivable. I would, I would love it, and I think a lot of you would agree with that. And and just talk to people, talk to your friends. You know, um, yes. the word. That's that's all you can do. Thank you, Jonathan. And I think you've given that uh, message strongly that there are there's room for strategies and room for pre-election work, but the trust in the ABC is at community level and perhaps talking, as you say, to our friends, colleagues, people in our community is one of the very powerful things. And I would say that's particularly true. That's particularly true in electorates that the Liberal Party holds at the moment. Um, or that are very marginal labor electorates uh, where the um, incumbent is clearly someone who's intrinsically hostile. I mean, for example, uh, in, uh, in Goldstein, Tim Wilson is a long standing um, yeah. uh, uh, activist in the IPA. Uh, now, certainly Daniel, of course, <coughs> is, is, is clearly uh, <laughs> in favor of the ABC and, and, and and, and the friends, I think, have rightly have judged that it might not be, it might be a little counterproductive to go too hard in that particular electorate um, because it will make it look like we're, you know, too close to Zoe Daniel. But there are other, uh, I mean, Dave Sharma here in Wentworth, where I am, tries to portray himself as a great friend of the ABC. Um, and so that's a more subtle uh, complication there. But yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going Jonathan, to- Jonathan, I'm, to, I'm no. going to have to interrupt you or I can't, Thank you properly. Uh, we'll get cut off at the socks here. Thank you so much for your time, the generosity and the preparation you've done for this evening's webinar, for you, your time in answering our questions so very carefully. Um, thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who attended tonight. Keep up the good work. Read the ABC um, state newsletters, the national newsletter and um, we'll, we'll keep uh, our advocacy for the ABC as strongly as we can. And, and can I just add that you can always uh, look at the alumni's website too, abcalumni.net, uh, without a .au for some reason, abcalumni.net. Um, and there's all sorts of stuff on there. So, some of it is not available to everyone, but most of it is. Um, there's articles yes. and there's other stuff. So it's worth checking out from time to time. Indeed it is. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you everybody for being with us. Yeah, and thanks to everyone for, um, for uh, tuning in, as they say. Well, they don't. <laughs> Clicking in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.